Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Before introducing our guest speaker, I will say a few words about our institution. Catalan Zeros is an independent think tank founded by members of civil society. We are a private, non-profit organization, and our goal is to introduce the liberal ideas and policies into the public sphere. Our founding principles are the recognition of pluralism, the exercise of tolerance, the defense of civil rights and individual liberties, and the promotion of inclusive governance, open societies, and the free market economy. Today, we are extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Jamie White. Jamie has worked as a philosophy lecturer at Cambridge, a foreign currency trader, and a management consultant. He was also the leader of the Classical Liberal Act Party in New Zealand in 2004, 2014, sorry. And he's also the, the author of four, book, four books and has won several writing awards, including the Reasons Foundation Bastiat Prize for Journalism. He's also a columnist for a number of publications, including The Times, Standpoint, Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal. And, he, and finally, he's currently the research director of the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is a free market think tank based in the UK and founded in 1955. Today, he will be speaking about one of our favorite topics, which is the road from the present uh, welfare state to a better welfare society based on the interesting case of, of New Zealand, which went from being a very protectionist and interventionist economy to one of the freest nations in, in the world in less than 30 years. So without any further ado, please welcome our guest, Jamie White. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I was invited to talk on the topic of from uh, the welfare state to the welfare society. Um, and I am going to do what I was asked, which is to talk about what happened in New Zealand. But unfortunately, that isn't an accurate description of it, uh, as you'll come to see. There was a great liberalization in New Zealand, but uh, it didn't really concern the welfare state. But I'll, I'll get to that uh, near the end of my talk. I plan, to talk, I plan to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we can just have a discussion about um, well, anything you want, but New Zealand in particular, I suppose. Now, I, I, Spain and New Zealand, or perhaps I should say Catalonia and New Zealand, have no historic connections. Uh, so you might not know much about New Zealand. We're a tiny country, the most remote country on Earth from a European point of view. In fact, I can tell you something funny. If you drilled from Auckland, my home city, uh, straight to the center of the earth and kept going in a straight line, you would come out in Barcelona, roughly, <laughs> um, just a bit south in the sea, but that's roughly where you'd come out. So we are absolutely on the opposite side of the world from you. So I'm going to give you a couple of little facts just to give you some context about New Zealand, mainly to show you how small it is and how young it is. New Zealand was... Uh, unoccupied by humans, completely unoccupied by humans and, in fact, by all mammals. There were no mammals in New Zealand, no native mammals at all. They were all introduced. The only native mammal is a variety of bat. Uh, bats are mammals. Uh, in around 1200 AD, no one's certain, 12, 1300, Polynesians migrated south from the islands in the Pacific, uh, they a collection of islands, actually, not, not just one, but mainly from the Cook Islands, or you may have heard of Rarotonga. Um, and Rarotongans and Maori, who are the indigenous people of New Zealand, they have roughly the same language. They can understand each other. That was about 1200, 1300 AD. Nobody's sure, as I say. In 1642, a Dutch sailor called Abel Tasman sighted New Zealand, but he didn't land. The reason he didn't land is because he, he's planning to land, and he, dock, he got his ship near enough the coast that they could row in dinghies, uh, small boats. But they saw a, a bunch of Maori were greeting them in a not very friendly way, and they decided they better not, uh, be, better not land. Then, no contact with Europeans at all for a century, roughly over a century, and, and Captain James Cook, the great British sailor, uh, landed there in 1769, uh, and he was the first European, he mapped the New Zealand, and he made several visits over the next 10 years. And that was when 
effectively New Zealand became a British colony. Settlements began, British people started moving to New Zealand in the early 19th century. And then there was a treat, there was obviously conflict between the British and the Maori. And there was a, the founding treaty of New Zealand it was something called the Treaty of Waitangi. It's a treaty between the, the, tr um, the leaders of the Maori tribes, of which there were many, dozens and dozens, and the crown, the you know, Queen, Queen Victoria, as it was at the time. And the treaty says, it's one of the most enlightened treaties that happened in the colonial era. The treaty, base, it's very short, it basically says, uh, you Maoris have to accept the sovereignty of the, the British royal family, the British crown. In return, you're citizens of Britain and you own all your land. It's yours, your private property under British law and if anybody wants it, they've got to buy it from you. Uh, so it was the, that's the foundation document of New Zealand in a sense and Maori like it very much. They want it honored. It has occasionally been violated. They're not opposed to this treaty. They don't think it was a, a bad one. They just want it to be honored. So then, then Basically, the popul if you look at a population chart of New Zealand, it's a pretty much a straight line. There wasn't any great sudden surge of population. It just kept going up, up, up. By 1900, it had reached 1 million. Uh, by 1950, it had reached 2 million. By 1990, it had reached 4 million. No, by the year 2000, it had reached 4 million. And now it's 4.6 million. So we're a very small country. Uh, I Catalonia, if it became its own country, would be more than twice as big, wouldn't it? Seven, roughly, okay, almost twice as big. So we're very small. Okay, that's, that's the very basic background. Now I'm going to give you the economic liberalization story. I was born in 1965. In 1960, and then, in, but I was born into the most economically illiberal country in the democratic world. It all changed in 1984, but I want to give you a sense of what it was like by, by giving you some examples, telling you how the economy was organized or how, what role the government played in it. First of all, even though we were an agricultural economy, the main thing that New, Zealanders, New Zealand did was produce uh, ag meat, wool, and milk and send it to Britain. Everything we exported went to Britain. I think 95% or 90% of New Zealand exports went straight to Britain. This was until Britain joined the European Union. Uh, but farmers were subsidized. There were subsidies per sheep. So if you owned a sheep, you got a bit of a, some money from the government. And the more sheep you owned, the more money you got. Uh, the interesting effect of this was that there were 80 million sheep in New Zealand and 3 million people when I was a boy. These, these sheep, interestingly, were quite skinny. And I'll come to the reason why in a minute. Uh, so we had agricultural subsidies. We had tariffs on imports. It, imported goods were unbelievably expensive. When I say tariffs, I mean it would double the price of a car. Uh, we had exchange rate controls. So you couldn't, the, the, the exchange rate was managed by the central bank and you weren't allowed to take money out of the country or send money out of the country without the government's permission. This actually became farcical in its implications. If you wanted to buy a book from overseas, because, you know, New Zealand's a small remote country, not all books are available there. You had to write to the government explaining why you needed, let's say, American dollars to buy this book with. And they would write back to you sometimes saying, well, are you sure you really need that book? Or couldn't you buy a similar book in New Zealand? And you had to explain yourself. If you wanted to go on a holiday, you would buy your, you'd go to the travel agency and buy your tickets. Then you'd send your tickets to the government and it would show how long you were going to be out of the country, and then you were allowed your allowance of foreign exchange for each day that you were out of the country. Now, it wasn't very much money, so if you wanted to go on a nice holiday, or stay in nice hotels, or you know, live it up when you were overseas, what people would do is they'd buy gold chain, um, and they'd wear it out of the country as jewelry, and then when they got out of the country, they'd sell it um, somewhere overseas so that they could afford their trip. I was a very keen tennis player. I was obsessed with tennis. But you couldn't get a good tennis racket in New Zealand. They weren't allowed in. And uh, so whenever anybody went on a foreign trip, I would give them money and beg them to buy me a tennis racket. But of course, they didn't want to, because that would be dipping into their foreign currency allowance. 
So it was all a, a great problem with the foreign exchange stuff. Uh, all, many industries were protected with various rules. One of the more amusing rules was that it was illegal in New Zealand to transport any goods in a truck, you know, a van, or a lorry, you know, a motor vehicle, more than 100 miles. Uh, the reason was uh, to protect the rail industry. So they didn't, you couldn't send something from Auckland to Wellington in a truck. It had to go on a train. Uh, there were many, many things like this. For example, it was illegal to buy margarine uh, without a doctor's certificate. This was to protect the dairy industry. Uh, there were unbelievable controls over commerce. You, shopping was, of course, completely banned on Sundays. But they also regulated the hours that shops could be open. And shops were allowed to be open late. After, they were allowed to be open after 5 p.m., uh, one day a week. And that was usually Thursday. And everybody got terribly excited. And there was kind of market fervor when people go out and it was dark and you could go to a shop on a Thursday night. It was terribly exciting. Um, they, uh, pubs, you know, bars, had to close at 6 o'clock at night. Now, if you find old bars in New Zealand, one of the interesting things about them is that up to about, up to about there, they've got tiles on the outside walls, ceramic tiles. The reason for this is that what would happen is people would finish work at 5 o'clock They'd race to the pub. They'd drink as much as they possibly could in one hour, and then they'd come out and vomit on the, on the wall outside, and the people would come with a hose and spray all the vomit off. Um, that's the kind of place it was. Uh, the government owned a great many businesses. They owned the airlines, the railways, the telephone companies, the television stations. There were only two televisions. When I was born, there was one television station. It started broadcasting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and it stopped broadcasting at 10 o'clock at night, and they played God Save the Queen uh, on the, uh, as the television shut down. By the time I was about 20 and going to university, television started at uh, 10 in the morning and stopped at midnight, because you wouldn't want people staying up after midnight. The, the government controlled, the government really controlled everything. The post office, some of the banks were state-owned. The radio, there was a radio station that was state-owned, still is. And then finally, just to give you a flavor, I'll tell you, oh no, there was one other, two other ridiculous things that the government did. Uh, one was that it wanted, it wanted certain industries to be in New Zealand, even though New Zealand wasn't a place of the scale to have them. So we had to have a car industry. But of course, we didn't really have a car industry. We couldn't produce one. What we really had was the government insist, made it illegal. You couldn't bring a car into the country. You could only bring the parts of a car into the country. So we would import, let's say, a car made in the United States, but it wasn't the car. It was all the bits of the car. And then there was a company in New Zealand that would put them together, assemble them, and then you could buy the car. So they were much more expensive. And there was a funny story about we used to do the same with television sets. We'd get them from Japan in pieces, and then those pieces would be assembled in New Zealand. But the Japanese started making their televisions in a way that didn't have these individual parts at first. So we had to ask them, could they please disassemble their television sets and then send them to us? Uh, so that was all to create pointless jobs. Now, you may wonder how all of this worked at all. Well, it worked because of the arrangement I told you where we could sell everything at ridiculous prices to, to Britain, everything we produced. So it was a very funny kind of an economy. It was a, in a fantasy kind of an economy. And then when Great Britain joined the European Union in 1972, or was it three, everything changed because the French stopped the imports of New Zealand agricultural goods. And suddenly we'd lost our main customer, so to speak. And things, the, the government of the day couldn't respond to the changes. They just tried to stick with the old model. And things started getting worse and worse and worse. And not just, not just bad economically, uh, the government was becoming more authoritarian. I mean, it was obviously already very authoritarian in the economy, but it, it started to have a flavor of being more generally, some of the interventions, economic interventions were extreme. So for example, we had an inflation problem, high inflation, as did many countries in the 1970s and early 1980s. And the prime minister's response to this the standard economic response is to increase interest rates. That's what they did in the United States. That's what happened in the United Kingdom. Um, our prime minister made it illegal to raise your prices. You couldn't 
increase the price of any of your goods without permission from the government, nor could you give anybody a pay rise without permission from the government. So the government effectively banned agency in the business world. They had a problem also with, um, because of uh, uh, foreign currency problems with uh, oil, and oil prices went up in the 70s again, and so the government's solution to this was to specify, everybody got a sticker, a, a coloured sticker, that they had to put on their car. And if you, let's say, had a yellow sticker, that meant you weren't allowed to drive your car on a Monday. If you had a green sticker, you weren't allowed to drive it on Tuesdays. One day a week, you weren't allowed to drive your car. And if the police saw you out and you had the wrong color sticker, well, you'd get arrested. And it was, so there was a great movement against this government. There was, the man running it was a chap called Robert Muldoon, and he was an absolute dreadful thug of a man. And his supporters called themselves Rob's Mob. I don't know if you know what mob means, but mob, the connotations of mob in English are that they're violent. And there was something violent about them. So what happened? In 1984, late 1983 actually, a new political party started up in New Zealand, started by a charismatic uh, multimillionaire. He'd made his multi-millions, by the way, in foreign property. Uh, Bob Jones was his name. And he started a party called the New Zealand Party. It's a very boring name, but it was a, it was a liberal, economically liberal party. And I joined it immediately. Uh, I was then 19, uh, an undergraduate at Auckland University. And one of the reasons I stuck with it, my, the woman who was the candidate for the party in my electorate was absolutely beautiful. And so this, this helped, this encouraged me to realize that the most beautiful people are liberals. Uh, but also, so this party started, took off, and in, in just nine months of existence, it had 15% support. And the Prime Minister began to panic. He was worried that he was going to lose the election. So he, the, the momentum of this party was growing and growing. So he call, called a so-called snap election, an earlier election than was due. Interestingly, you can find footage of this on YouTube if you want to. Look it up. You'll see what a nasty little man he was. But you'll also see that when he called the election, he was completely drunk. He could hardly speak, he's slurring his words, but, but there was a lot of drinking in New Zealand in those days, still is. Um, okay, so the New Zealand party is doing very well. It's campaigning openly on liberal ideas. We want to deregulate the economy, privatize all the state businesses. Oh, I didn't tell you what tax rates were, sorry. My, at the end of the Muldoon era, my father was paying 66% income tax. Uh, so it hadn't gone quite as far as the United Kingdom, but it was still pretty high. So that, those were the policies of the New Zealand Party. The Labour Party, so I should just give you the names of these parties. The government of the time was called the National Party. It was the centre-right party, traditionally a party that represented the interests of farmers and the crony capitalist businessmen that got the favours from the government. Uh, the, and then there was the Labour Party, and it had been a two-party kind of a system, like the British electoral system favours two parties. And this new party emerged, the New Zealand Party. Anyway, what happened was that the Labour Party won quite easily. They had no manifesto. They didn't declare, they didn't have any policies. They didn't tell people what they were going to do. And one of the reasons they didn't tell anybody what they were going to do is that what they were going to do was a radical liberalisation of the economy, even though they were the Labour Party. They didn't want to risk their vote, because if they told the truth, they probably wouldn't have got elected. Anyway, they got in. And there was a chap called Roger Douglas. He wasn't the Prime Minister, he was the Minister of Finance. And he was the driving force in the government. The actual Prime Minister was a vain, a very fat, very fat man. Uh, so fat that he had to have his stomach stable. You know that stomach thing where you can, where it's made so small that just one bread roll will fill you up. He had that done, but he, he managed to stay fat. And everyone said, how does he stay fat? And so, but apparently he just was endlessly eating chocolate. Chocolate was going through him the whole time. Anyway, he was very vain. He was very eloquent. He was a great speaker, but he didn't have much vision. And this guy, Roger Douglas, was the opposite. Not very charismatic, not a good public speaker, but a, a absolutely determined reformer. And here's what they did. They immediately got rid of the exchange controls on the currency, and they floated the New Zealand dollar. They eliminated all the subsidies in agriculture, and even more radically, they eliminated all tariffs. 
New Zealand today has no tariffs on imports. We don't, it, it's unilateral free trade. We don't care if you can tax us. The French, you know, the European Union puts tariffs on New Zealand stuff. We put no retaliatory tariffs on EU things. Uh, I'll pause on the subsidies for a moment, for agricultural subsidies. It's a nice example of markets at work. They just said, okay, they're gone. The, farm, the subsidies to the sheep farmers, they're gone. The value of farmland collapsed. Some farmers went broke, some didn't, some did. The lower value of the farmland gave other people an opportunity to come in and buy the cheaper farms. The absence of subsidies changed the way people went about their farming. And there were two very clear things that changed. The first was that the number of sheep, I told you that you got paid per sheep that you owned. So the number of sheep went down by a third. But interestingly, the weight of the lamb being exported didn't go down at all. Because it, think about it, if you get paid per sheep, you want a lot of sheep, but you don't want to feed them very much. Um, whereas when you've got a proper uh, economic incentives, you want, your, you want to fatten your sheep up so you get a lot of meat off them. But more interestingly, this was the beginning of the New Zealand wine industry. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but New Zealand has quite a successful wine industry. And it started because land, when you get paid for, per sheep, again, you don't care where you put the sheep. So sheep were being farmed on land that was not suitable for sheep farming. And when the subsidies were gone, farmers looked at this land and they said, I can't farm sheep on it anymore. What am I going to do with it? And it turned out that a lot of it was very good for grapes. And so we got a wine industry. Nobody ever would have anticipated that would be the effect, but that was the effect. Uh, you can never predict these things. So they got rid of the subsidies. They got rid of the uh, tariffs. They turned state-run enterprises, state, like the railways and the telephone and all these kinds of things, they turned them into what they called state-owned enterprises. And they were still owned by the government, but they had to be run, they had normal commercial people on the boards, and they had to be run to make a profit. And they introduced competition. So these companies were no longer monopolies. They had to compete with other ones. And this was a step towards selling them. So the idea was that you have operated as a state-owned enterprise for a couple of years. It gets normal accounts. It becomes a normal kind of an enterprise. And then you can sell it. And that's what happened in, in many cases. They were sold. Some weren't, unfortunately. Uh, I'll get back to that when I tell you how things are going today. But so it was a big change, and then they, and they also changed the tax system. So they reduced the top rate of tax from 66% uh, to 33%, which is a big change. They reduced the standard rate from, I think, 35% to 28%. And they introduced a sales tax, a goods and services tax. So they changed the structure of the tax system and massively simplified it. They got rid of all the exemptions and the, you know, you can get a bit off for this and a bit off for that and all the, all the little fiddly details. So we, and to, the, to this day, we have a wonderfully simple tax system in New Zealand. They were still a Labour Party, though, and it's, it's important to bear this in mind because some of the things that they didn't quite get right were partly because they were a Labour Party. One thing, I, again, I forgot to tell you about how dreadful it was before they came along. Uh, it was... We had compulsory unionism. You weren't allowed a job unless you were a member of the union for that job. It wasn't your choice. You weren't allowed it. Even students. When I was a student, I was obliged by law to pay $180, I, I recall it, $180 membership fee of the student union because you weren't allowed to go to university without joining the student union. Now, this is because the Labour... And now the Labour Party comes in with this liberalising agenda the one thing they don't liberalize is the labor markets because they can't completely alienate their base. And it wasn't until they were kicked out two terms later and, a, and an improved version of the National Party came in, they then got rid of compulsory unionism. But that, that happened a little later. The other thing they did that I will talk about later is they introduced some environmental laws which have turned out to be very damaging because again, you know, they were a Labour Party and they had certain kinds of people in their ranks and they wanted to do something for the environment. Uh, now, one of the important things to note about this is how quickly it all happened. They, th we have a three-year electoral term in New Zealand, very short. They figured that they were going to get thrown out for doing all this. 
So they wanted to do as much as they possibly could, as quickly as possible. That was one reason. The other reason was that uh, Roger Douglas, who's spoken all around the world about how to reform uh, policy, is a great believer that if you don't do things quickly, it gives the interest groups time to assemble and to fight you. So you don't want gradual reform, you want sudden reform. Another way he put it once was that if you're going to have a general strike for one reform, you might as well have it for 10 reforms. Uh, so all of this was done unbelievably quickly. All of the, those changes, the total transformation of the New Zealand economy was done in four years, because Roger Douglas lost his job in four years. It was internal fighting in the Labour Party. I won't bore you with the details. So what was the effect of it? Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to talk to you about GDP and all that stuff. We can talk about that later. The, the real effect of it was what it was like to be living in New Zealand. Prior to these reforms, it was a bit like living in Yugoslavia. I mean, we had a bit more democracy, but life was grey. You, could, you couldn't pursue your interests. There was no opportunity for entrepreneurial energy. You were always crushed. In fact, the only way really to get ahead was to be in with the government. My father was perpetually frustrated, and he, he was entrepreneurial type. And you needed to get permits and licenses and all that kind of thing. And unless you were friends with politicians, you didn't get that. Um, one very great sign of all the changes that the, the, the economy had been liberalized was that up until these changes, all the head offices of the big businesses in New Zealand were in Wellington. Wellington is the capital, but it's not the economic center. It's not a very big place. It's only 300,000 people. Auckland is the economic center of New Zealand. After these reforms, all the head offices moved from Wellington to Auckland because being friends with the politicians didn't matter anymore. You had to be friends with your customers. So that's, that was a very visible change. But life changed, I can't tell you the transformation, I just can't. New Zealand was not part of the modern world in 1985. By 1990, I mean, we had no, re there were no restaurants, there was no imported consumer goods, we had two state-run television stations. My favorite sport, as I told you, was tennis. I couldn't, wa I could never see any tennis. Because we had two stations and they weren't gonna play, they weren't gonna play American tennis tournaments. On t I mean, it was horrible. And there was this heavy feeling, it, it was a joyless society. And it isn't anymore. I mean, people who were alive, who died in 1983, if you brought them back today and showed them New Zealand, they would think that you'd taken them to the Caribbean or something, or, or California. They'd think you'd taken them to California, the, you know, the vitality of the place. And that's what really mattered. And we got all sorts of things that we never had. We had immigrants coming in again, and not just from Pacific Islands. The only immigrants to New Zealand up, up until then were miserable British people, um, oddly enough, many of whom left Britain because they were racist and didn't like the migrants coming from the West Indies to Britain. And then they moved to New Zealand and were surprised to discover that 15% of the population was dark-skinned. Um, there was this myth that New Zealand was Britain in the 1950s. But we got, started getting migrants. We, we got... Um, We've got a lot of Chinese now, a lot of Indians. We've got Argentinians, French, Germans, no Spaniards for some reason. Um, I think maybe it's linguistic. Uh, and we've, tourism has taken off. By the way, one of the things the government owned prior to all this was the tourist hotels. Can you imagine the joy of staying in a government-owned hotel? It really is like Yugoslavia. So it was, a, it was a wonderful transformation, and New Zealand has joined the world We've divert, the economy's diversified hugely in terms of who we export to uh, and in terms of what we do uh, in all sorts of very unpredictable ways. Uh, for example, we have, you probably know we have a film industry because of, you'll have seen Lord of the Rings. Uh, New Zealand has had quite an advanced film industry for quite a while. It wasn't just Lord of the Rings. And a lot of it's invisible to you because it draws on the skills of the technicians and the film, the, the production skills, and a lot of American advertisements are made in New Zealand. They, they come to New Zealand where they've got the skill, but it's a bit cheaper, and they've got the beautiful landscapes and so on. And the gaming industry, you know, the people who make these games where you kill each other on TV, and you know what I mean, gaming, I don't, I'm too old, but that, that's big in New Zealand as well. And these are things that you can do from a remote place like New Zealand. So I, I think it's been a, it's been a success story, broadly.
<clears throat> now I want to tell you the now I want to get to the but, and which I started with, and, and it has been an imperfect transition, uh, for two reasons really. Uh, one was something that I mentioned earlier. The Labour government introduced something. Well, they they introduced the le they've designed the legislation, and then the six next government, the National Party, they they passed it through Parliament. It's something called the Resource Management Act. It's a law concerning the use of land. So, if you want to use, if you buy some land in New Zealand, under British law, I don't know how your law is, but there's a, an, a basic principle of the British, of the English legal system, which is that you are permitted to do anything if it isn't explicitly prohibited. So you're free, except for the things that we specify you can't do. Not in land use in New Zealand. If you want, you, can, you cannot just buy some land and then do what you want with it, build what you want on it. You have to get permission from the government or from local governments, to use your own land as you wish. And this Resource Management Act is the law that applies in these cases. And it's terribly, terribly restrictive. And it mainly is restrictive by giving third parties power to stop you. Uh, do any of you know what NIMBY means? No. NIMBY... It, right yes, yes. Okay, it's an acronym. It's N-I-M-B-Y, and it means not in my backyard. It's a, it's a British kind of expression. And what it refers to is the ability of people, the people who are always objecting to any development because it spoils their, their life. Right? I've got a nice house, I've got a nice garden, I've got a pleasant view. I don't want somebody to build something just over there, especially if it's cheap housing for poor people. I really don't want that. But New Zealand, and, and many countries have rules like this, but the Resource Management Act went way, way further because you can object to things that aren't even in your backyard. I can object to something because I don't like thinking about it, even though I'm a 1,000 miles away from it. I'm not making this up. So if you, uh, you've got a plan to develop something in one city, I live in another city, I can object to it because it, it, it up, when I think about the snails, let's say, being hurt in the building process, I get upset. And I can write a letter and object, and, and they have to listen to this. Um, that has been, con the law has been changed to limit that a little bit. But the other thing that the law does is it gives the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maori, great powers to stop things. There's this kind of an implicit idea that's grown up in New Zealand that Maori are somehow the real owners of New Zealand, even if they don't literally own the land. And if their sensibilities are upset by development, well then they can stop it. So what's happened, and this is a, effectively the Resource Management Act provides a barrier to, it allows certain people to erect a barrier to property development. Maoris, environmentalists, and so on. Now of course, if it gives them that power, they're going to use it, and they're gonna use it primarily so that you pay them to take it down. And that's what happens. Every development is objected to by Maori tribes you, the developer, then come along and pay them a f an inspection fee. Um, th this inspection fee, they, they go and say some magic words and so on, and, and then, the, the, then it's okay, you can go ahead and develop. And that costs you, it depends on the size of the development. If it's a small development, it might cost you 20,000. If it's a big one, it might cost you f half a million. Um, and a lot of Maori tribes just get an income from objecting to developments and then getting bribed to, to take the, their objection away. The effect of this is quite extraordinary. New Zealand is, is a physically about the same size as Japan. It has four and a half million people and we have a shortage of residential land, uh, land available for residential property. It's bigger than Britain. Britain has 70 million people and we, we've got a shortage of land. It's created by these laws. If you look, there are also, I didn't mention some other things, you're not allowed, there's something called the urban-rural boundary. You're not allowed to develop residential property on the rural side of the urban-rural boundary. Land that is on, is on one side of that boundary, the rural side, well, so I'll put it the other way around. The land on the urban side 
we are allowed to develop property, costs 12 times as much as land on the other side. The ratio of the value of a house in Auckland, the average house price to the average income, is this a standard ratio here? Uh, is 10 to 1. So the average house is 10 times the average annual income. In 1980, it was three times the average income. In London, it's nine times. Auckland is more expensive relative to incomes than London is. So this has had a terrible effect. Uh, it, it makes people poorer, obviously, uh, because, but it also has created a lot of anti-foreigner feeling. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of migration to New Zealand, especially from Chinese, and they buy property, of course. And when people are looking for somebody to blame about why property prices are going up, instead of seeing that the problem is a restriction on the supply of land, they blame the increased demand. And, of course, it's the foreigners. And we have a new government now, and they've instituted anti-foreigner laws around uh, buying property and so on. Uh, and, this, and it's just breeding anti-foreigner sentiment. The other effect it has, which is a subtle one, uh, is a political effect, is that, as Margaret Thatcher understood, owning your own home makes you a kind of a capitalist. You, you've got a valuable capital asset. And it changes your cast of mind a little bit. In New Zealand, we had a home ownership rate of something like 75-80%, usually. That's to say 80% of people were living in a house that they owned or that their parents owned. That's declining and declining. It's down to something like low 60s now, and it seems set to decline further. That will naturally shift politics to the left. This is also happening in, in Great Britain, as a matter of fact. So that, that was one of the big blunders of that reform era. But, but now I'm going to get on to the, the title um, of this talk. All the reforms that I told you about, uh, they were not, they didn't concern the welfare state. They, we, they privatized businesses that were run by the government. Or own, they changed the tax structure. They, they liberalized the um, trade environment, including the foreign exchange. But they didn't touch the state monopoly in education or health care or old age pension, or retirement savings, or unemployment insurance. All of those things they kept. And they're utterly, they seem to be entrenched in New Zealand. The chap, no, I'm gonna now connect this with me a little bit, my political career. I mentioned Roger Douglas, who drove through these reforms. In 1988, he wanted to institute a flat income tax in New Zealand. It would, have been, it would have been a flat income tax rate of 25% from the first dollar you earned to the millionth dollar you earned. And the people, other people in the Labour Party just couldn't, they couldn't do this. It was too much for them. And so he got fired as the Minister of Finance. Then the government went through a succession, then the Prime Minister, the fat one, um, he had an affair with uh, a woman and it became very well known and he quit. That's what he just, so I quit. Um, and then another one took over, and he was in the job for three months, and he got fired, and the, they were in meltdown. So they lost the election in 1990. In 1993, Roger Douglas, who was still a Labour member of Parliament, wrote a book called Unfinished Business. And what was that unfinished business? It was the fact that he'd failed to move, because he only had four years, he hadn't had a chance to move on to the welfare state. And this book laid out a kind of program for reforming the welfare state along the lines that he had done with the economy. <clears throat> that, that book and Roger Douglas himself uh, were the f kind of founders of the political party that I later became the leader of. It's called the, it's the ACT Party. The reason it's called ACT, it's an acronym as well, it had originally been the Association of Consumers and Taxpayers. And the agenda of ACT, it changed over the years from time to time, uh, but it was to privatize insurance, uh, to privatize retirement savings. In New Zealand at the moment, we have quite a generous state pension, but it's funded from current taxes. It's a pay-as-you-go system. There's no actual savings behind it. So the idea was to privatize uh, old age saving, uh, retirement savings, and the, then there was some we never had that strong ideas in healthcare, but in education, we wanted to move to a system where 
what you'd call a voucher system or charter school system. So there are no state schools, but the state gives parents some money that they can take, or a voucher, that they can spend at a private school to educate their children. Uh, and then on welfare, uh, that, that's a very difficult issue in New Zealand. One of the reasons, New Zealand was a very early country to adopt, uh, I mean, unemployment benefits and so on. New Zealand was one of the first countries in the world to adopt them. And we also were one of the first countries in the world to pay women, uh, well, as mainly women, to have single parent benefits. And unfortunately, large segments of the population are now adapted to the system. And it would be very difficult to with withdraw it in the short term, it would be very painful, but I think it should be done. Let me give you some statistics around this. Um, in 19, all through history of New Zealand, and it's the same for Great Britain, the two countries I know best, the rate of births to unmarried women was 5%. It basically just goes flat, flat, it's 5%, and then in World War II it goes up, for obvious reasons, um, because uh, the husband's uh, away uh, fighting and uh, other men are around and um, things like that. So um, it, it pops up, it just goes up to 10% during World War II and then it comes back down to 5 afterwards. Then it's flat, flat 5%. 1972, you see the chart just goes like this, just a line, just goes, starts going up. Uh, that was when they instituted the, single, the payment for single parents. It was quite generous, so you really could afford to raise your children without working if you were a single mother. And by today, it's gone from 5% up to, it's now 50% of children in, Britain, in New Zealand are born to an unmarried woman. And in the Maori population, it's 80%. So the, this welfare system in New Zealand is deeply entrenched, and it's had a massive effect on society. I, I'm not quite sure how to reverse that one uh, from a political point of view. But my party, before I became the leader of it, did have a success with charter schools or voucher system. We became a, New Zealand moved, I should say, to a proportional representation system in 1996. And so you have coalition governments. And we became a member of a coalition government. We've been a member of a couple. And we, a condition that we made for joining was that they would start charter schools. And uh, New Zealand's a small country, but we got about 15, no, about 12 started. And they've been very, they're aimed, part of the legislation said they had to be aimed at poor people and primarily Maori and Pacific children. I objected to that, but, and it was a political deal. So that was the deal, and we started these schools, and they've been very, very successful. They're really, they're really great. They, the, because they, get, they teach children in different ways, they take children who are doing badly in the state schools, and they give them, sometimes they give them more freedom, sometimes they give them more discipline, They've, there's a variety of different approaches. It's a kind of a market, so it's how, what you'd expect. Well, unfortunately, we just got a new government in New Zealand uh, about six months ago. It's a coalition of the Labour Party, the Greens, and a populist, nationalist, anti-foreigner party. It's a funny collection of parties. They've banned foreigners from buying land in New Zealand. They've made your first year at university free. Why your first one, I'm not quite sure. Um, they've just banned the oil and natural gas exploration industry in New Zealand offshore. That's been banned. And they're trying to shut down the partnerships, the, the charter schools. And the reason they, they're trying to shut down the... No, you might think they wouldn't, right? The Labour Party, surely they want to help the children of poor families and Maori and Pacific Island children. That's their natural constituency. But they get more support from the teachers' unions. And the teachers' unions hate charter schools because charter schools compete with state schools and they don't require you to be a qualified teacher. I could go and teach at a, at a charter school. In fact, I know one charter school that won't let a qualified teacher into the building. Um, they think they're satanic. Uh, so uh, it's things... so. Let me sum up where I think we are in New Zealand now. <clears throat> the reform process that started in 1984 and went on more or less continuously till 1996, and it stopped a little before, but went on for roughly 10 years. That ended when we got proportional representation. We, by the way, we have the German system, exactly. You get two votes, one for the party and one for the local area. 
Um, <clears throat> so that stopped. But the great thing is it stopped. I, I think whatever the situation is, reform stops when you get proportional representation. Proportional representation means you're endlessly compromising and only small policy moves are made. But the good fortune for New Zealand is that we got it at a point when we'd just gone through a great liberalization program. And so now it's been the enemies of that program who have been hindered by the system. And so we still have a very, uh, a very free economy. Uh, the Fraser Institute, which is a Canadian think tank, every year does a economic freedom index. And the top three are always New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, and we're still number three. So things aren't that bad. Uh, and I think that this government, I'm, uh, I'm being, maybe I'm being optimistic, but this new government is so terrible. And, and they're, they're visibly incompetent. That's the other thing. The prime minister is a woman I know personally. She's a lovely woman. Um, she's 36. She's currently about to give birth. She, she, she was pregnant, it turned out, during the election, but nobody knew. And I think she's going to be the first uh, first prime minister or president anywhere in the world to actually give birth while prime minister. There have been fathers, but there's never been a mother, I don't think. Uh, and as I say, she's a lovely woman, but she's a bit dumb, and she's um, never had a job. She was, she's ne I'm the, this is the amazing fact about her. She was a student, uh, she was a, the president of the world's socialist student organization. Uh, then she got, then she started working in politics, and she got elected. She never got elected, she got in on, the, she got off on the list. She wasn't directly elected, she was, uh, she got in from the proportional system we have. She never held a position in, in, in an executive position. She never had a, role, a ministerial role. Uh, she became the leader of the party just weeks before the election because the previous leader was hopeless, and she has a nice smile, and they thought she would do better, and she did do better. But honestly, this is her first job, and her first job is to be the Prime Minister of New Zealand. And since she's become Prime Minister, she's really doing a terrible job. She seems, you, you can tell that she is out of her depth. Every crisis that comes up, she just does nothing, as if she's, doesn't, she's in a panic. Um, and now when she is away now, give, having her baby, the leader of the nationalist, populist, I'd call them quasi-fascist party, he's going to be uh, the leader of the party, uh, the, the prime minister. But he's 73 years old and he drinks so heavily that I, I don't think I don't think he's going to do much. I, I can tell you some funny stories about him later on if, if we're talking, but I think the population is going to recoil at this and we'll get, in three, two and a half years' time, we'll get a sensible government again and maybe we'll get back on the right tracks. Um, but as I say, I, though I, I give a slightly pessimistic spin of what's just happened, New Zealand has still uh, got very good policies. We have the rule of law, an utterly dependable rule of law in New Zealand, that's one of the reasons the Chinese will want to buy property there. Uh, and it's a delightful place. And if you get the chance to go, I can't recommend it highly enough. Thank you. Hello, thank Hi. you for your talk. Uh, what, what happened to that guy that made the reforms? And the, the, do people recognize the, that the, those reforms were so important to improve yeah. the People, country? yes. So people, Roger, do you remember Reaganomics, it was called? At the time that Ronald Reagan came in, it was, his economic reforms were referred to as Reaganomics. In New Zealand, Roger, his name was Roger Douglas. They called it Rogernomics. Uh, and so Rogernomics, you can find an entry for Rogernomics in Wikipedia. It's written by somebody hostile to it. 
Roger Douglas is the Margaret Thatcher of New Zealand. That's to say he's absolutely polarising. People either love him and think he saved the country or despise him for turning New Zealand into a neoliberal hellhole. Uh, so he, is, he is probably the most divisive figure in the history of New Zealand politics. Now, what happened to him is that, of course, he f after because it was a Labour Party making these economic changes, the liberalisation, you can imagine the effect. It, and it was a bit odd that the previous National Party had been so interventionist. Everything seemed to have been turned on its head. And what happened when after the when Labour was in power, they kicked out this Muldoon guy, the, the bad one, the nasty little one I told you about, and the National Party reformed itself, and so they came around to market ideas again. The Labour Party had terrible internal disputes, because you can imagine a lot of people in the Labour Party were against these changes. So by 1990, we were back to normal a normal situation with a pro-market pro National Party and an anti-ish market uh, Labour Party. Roger Douglas was out of favour inside the Labour Party. He started this, what was then a pressure group called the Association of Consumers and Taxpayers uh, Act. When proportional representation was introduced, it, in 1993 we discovered that we were going to have it and the first election of that kind would be in 1996. So what happened at that point was that all the the factions of the two main parties split off and formed separate parties. Uh, so you've got a green bunch forming, coming out of the Labour Party mainly. you got um, a populist, the one I mentioned, the one the, the populist nationalist one. That was some people from the National Party, but some from the Labour Party. And then you got my party, the Act became a party, and it took people, it took the people who had been the drivers of that reform out of the Labour Party, and then also the, the Liberal people from the National Party, a few. In, at the first election, the 1996 election, Act got 9% of the vote, which is pretty significant. We were a major presence in, in, in Parliament. And we did okay, the party, you know, we have three election every three years. We did okay for the first few elections. Uh, then we had trouble with scandals. Now, by the way, I should tell you, Roger Douglas had dropped out. He, he was quite old by this point, and he didn't want to be involved actively. And there were other people who were driving it forward. But his ideology, and he was still very influential, even to this day he is, uh, it, it's kind of, it's been seen as, I mentioned that book, Unfinished Business. The party is a vehicle for carrying on these ideas. <clears throat> you want to think New Zealand's a bit of a funny country because I tell you these stories, but we had a Maori woman uh, who was a very intelligent woman in the party. It was good for us to have a Maori woman because people thought we didn't like Maoris. Um, and she was very articulate. And, and, and she was also very fat. Um, but then she suddenly became very thin. And people thought, What's, why, why has she gone from being so fat to so thin so quickly? And she had this... <laughs> It, she had this boyfriend, a very good-looking but violent. He was a kind of a violent thug. And uh, he was younger than her and, and charismatic. And she lost all this weight suddenly. And it turned out that she'd had that surgery herself. Everyone in New Zealand was having this, the, the, the stomach staple thing. That's not a problem. The problem was that she'd embezzled the money for it from a charity that she was running. And she was also living the high life with her boyfriend um, spending money on foreign trips and champagne and all that, all the stolen money. Um, now, that was a bad scandal for our party. Then, uh, just shortly afterwards, there was another scandal where one of our MPs, again, a lovely chap, but when he was a student, he read a novel about uh, a kind of a spy who stole... He, he got a new identity by stealing the details of a dead baby. So, you know, a, a baby dies... And you go and you pretend to be that person, you use their details, and you get a passport and so on in that name. So he did this as a, when a student because he thought it would be fun to see if he could. But he got caught and he got a conviction. And then when he later in life, when he was an MP for us, somebody from our own party who didn't like him re released this to the press. And that was a scandal. And then we had another scandal involving the big fat Kim.com, you know, that enormous... Because he was there, he, he gave one of our people some money. And, uh, 
So there's scandal after scandal after scandal. And we were going down and down in the polls. And we got down to having just one MP. And the last guy, the last scandal is why I'm, I got the job as leader. Uh, because they were desperate at this point. <laughs> and they would take anyone. Uh, <laughs> so that's the kind of history of the ACT Party. The ACT Party to this day, so I, I, I didn't get into Parliament, but we did get one member of Parliament. And he continues. Uh, he's, he's, he's young and he's pretty good. He's a reasonably good politician. I don't think he'll be involved in any scandals. Uh, he's going on this TV program. I do, do you have it here in Spain? It seems to be everywhere. Dancing with the Stars. So they get... Do you have this? He's going to go, go on that soon. So that'll make him or break him. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that last year I've been in New Zealand and I loved your country. And uh, well, uh, my question is: uh, I'd like that you say if you think that there is some relation between the size of the country and uh, how freer it is. Uh, and for example, in this case of uh, the tariffs that was banned. Uh, in New Zealand, do you think that it would be possible in like a big country that can produce everything inside of its country? Uh, yeah, New Zealand's size is an enormously important feature of it. It, it explains a lot about it. Just to, anecdotally, I mean, you, if you are in politics, if you're involved in public life in New Zealand, you know almost everybody else who is personally, and. It, there's still a slight village feel about things. When I was uh, living in New Zealand between 2004 and 8, I wasn't in politics at that time, but I lived in a similar area to the then Prime Minister, uh, the woman who tried to become the Secretary General of the United Nations, Helen Clark. I, we attended the same gym, and I would often bump into her coming up the, stair, the back stairs when I was going down. She didn't have any security, uh, and she'd, just, she'd nod because she knew you knew who she was. Once my father wanted to had an idea, this is in the late 1970s, he had an idea for an economic policy. So he looked up the number, he got the phone book out and looked up the phone number of the Minister of Finance and rang him at home. And they chatted for about an hour on the phone on a Tuesday night. It was like, like that. And there are still very high levels of trust in New Zealand. Uh, people really, and partly because you'll be caught out. If you, if you cheat people, if you don't behave well, like when you live in a village, word gets around and, and, um, and it constrains your behavior. Now, that has, those are some of the good effects. Some of the bad effects are that, there's an, in my opinion, there's an inclination towards collectivism. Uh, there's, a, there's a quick feeling like we're all just one big group. And that has, that has been so, somewhat eroded by migration. New Zealand used to be 90% white people of British descent and 10% Maori. Now it's 10% Maori, I think about 4% Pacific Islanders, who are Polynesians mainly themselves, like Maori are Polynesian. Uh, I think, I'm sorry, these figures aren't exact, but I think it's about 12% Chinese, uh, maybe a little lower, but in Auckland, higher. Uh, Indian population's gone up a lot. Um, and there's, as I said, there are some immigrants, there's still a lot of immigrants from Britain, and there are some from continental Europe and some from Latin America. Auckland is now the city with the most, has the highest number of people not born in that country of any city in the world next to Toronto, I think. So New Zealand and Canada are having quite a similar pattern of migration. And they're actually similar countries temperamentally. Scottish Presbyterians um, by, by temperament before all these changes. So I, 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 I do think the size of New Zealand has had an influence on our politics. The environment, the other thing is that the beauty of the country, because it, New Zealanders are very proud of the, the physical place. Uh, and my attachment to New Zealand it isn't really cultural or social. I much prefer England. 
a, as a social place. But it's the, it's, it's the land, the sky, the sea. You just feel, and that drives a lot of the environmentalism in New Zealand. So the, this powerful desire to protect the environment, I think, comes partly from the beauty of it. I mean, if you live in Dubai, you know, what do you care? Just build something. God, there's nothing there. Um, you, know, you can't spoil Dubai. Um, so I, the, 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 it is unique in some ways. I think there's another thing I want to say about it that I, I should have mentioned in my talk, which is that uh, its youth is also an important fact when it comes to social welfare in particular. In Great Britain, I don't know about Spain, but in the 19th century, and I expect it was the same here, in the 19th century, when you had a laissez-faire capitalist regime in Great Britain, there was a great explosion of, uh, well, you could call it welfare organizations, but they were private. So the first, if you, need, seek, if you need to seek help, if you're in trouble and you need to go to someone, the first place you go is your family. And so the family is the primary social unit of welfare. Then the church, it used to be the church, uh, may still be in some Catholic countries, I think the church is still more important. But then in the 19th century, other organizations started to develop, these so-called friendly societies that were often formed, they were cooperatives, they were often groups of people in the same profession. Um, if you look at the names of some of them that still exist, they're called things like medical and clerical. That's because they were doctors or priests, and they would contribute money into a pool and if one of their members got sick or died, the money would go to the wife, uh, the children. To, so that's social welfare, but it's private. And these organizations had blossomed uh, in the 19th century. And then in, in Great Britain, they were destroyed by the emergence, the, the state entering uh, the provision of welfare. So if the state taxes you to pay for an unemployment benefit, you're not also going to contribute money to the private mechanism. It's exactly the same with state schools. By, by 1895, 90% of British children got at least four years education in a private school. Then the state started supplying schools. And of course, if you're being taxed to pay to go to a school that's free, you're not gonna pay to go to a, a private school. It's exactly the same thing happened in, in welfare. So the state, in, in unemployment insurance, the state crowded the private sector out of this area. It's not that there was none. There's a fantasy a lot of people have in their heads that there was no medical care, there were no schools, there, were no, there was no insurance for unemployment until the state provided it. It's simply false. The state, the state pushed out the private supply. And I'm not going to bore you with, the detail, with an argument, but the private supply was better for many reasons that hopefully I don't need to explain to this audience. Interesting difference with New Zealand is New Zealand never had any of that. New Zealand has no pre-state history. Being such a young country, almost all the, it had the church, very rudimentary kind of church, and almost no other social institutions. The only social institutions, civic, you know, I mean, private institutions in New Zealand were uh, sports clubs, actually. Uh, rugby clubs, cricket clubs, things like that. Um, that the church, the state, and sport clubs. We never had that history that England did. And again, that affects the politics a bit because nobody's got any idea that some of these things can be done by something other than the state. I mean, if you, if you, put, if you suggested to people that you could have private unemployment insurance, most New Zealanders just wouldn't even understand the concept. Um, so I, I fear we'll never get rid of the state state's role in the provision of welfare in New Zealand. They tried, some people, there was a, it's been tried. There was a referendum on introducing a private, a compulsory private pension scheme, like the kind they have in Singapore and Australia and Chile. Uh, and it lot, the vote, it was 93% against. We would never see it, you've never seen a result like this in a New Zealand election, 93%. Well, we have time for one more. Alguna pregunta més? Thank you. You're right that we don't hear much about New Zealand, in Catalonia at least, but one thing that I did come across was that this new government you spoke about, 
um, put a ministry for uh, denuclearization. Is that right? Denuclearization. Yes. Uh, so I, I didn't know that, but uh, I try not to look. I get upset. Uh, New Zealand has a nuclear policy. It's a very interesting. I, I, I wanted to talk about this, actually, and I forgot. Um, as I said, that, that Labour Party that I loved so much that did all those great reforms, it was nonetheless still a Labour Party, as I, and they brought in this terrible environmental legislation. One other thing they did, which was almost entirely gestural, was that they, they made New Zealand a nuclear-free zone. Now, New Zealand already was a nuclear-free zone. We don't, we don't need nuclear power because we have all these rivers and we, use, we get hydro... 90% uh, of energy in New Zealand is renewable and it's, it all comes from water. Not all, but most. Uh, so we never need a new, we're never going to have a nuclear power plant, but the issue, the, the, the issue got traction around uh, American naval vessels. American naval ships would come to New Zealand and dock there for a while. We're part of an, a military alliance with the United States. And the Americans have a policy of never saying whether or not a vessel has a nuclear weapon on it or whether it's nuclear powered. They, they won't say. So they brought in this rule saying, well, if you're not going to say, then we can't have any of your ships in our harbours anymore. And this was presented as a noble stand against the nuclear threat, except that it, wasn't, it was nothing of the sort. New Zealand was still committed to the policy of nuclear deterrence. We supported the Americans having nuclear weapons, and we wanted them to protect us with those nuclear weapons. We just weren't willing to take the risk of having them in our harbor. It's like you, there's a, you live in a village, and there's a big guy with a gun, and he says, I'll protect you with my gun, but if you wouldn't mind, would you store some of the bullets in your house? And you go, no, I don't want the bullets. They might go off at night, um, but I still want you to protect me with your, your gun. You keep the bullets at your house. There's nothing noble about that. This was a policy we should have been ashamed of, but it has become a sacred element uh, of New Zealand policy making. Nobody, it would be, you might as well not run for election if you say I'm going to overturn that. It's, it's a symbolic thing. I have no idea, I have no idea why. Uh, but yeah, we're nuclear free. That's one great achievement. Uh, okay, I, I have two, two last questions before leaving. Okay. Mm. Considering how massive agricultural subsidies are here in, in Europe, uh, how would you draw the, the comparison between what's going on here and, and in New Zealand? And second, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Roger Douglas actually tried to push forward uh, policies including uh, moving from uh, public provision of goods to more cash transfers to people in need and, and compulsory um, saving accounts. I don't know if this has been accomplished in, in, in some way. It hasn't. Um, so I'll, I'll do them in reverse yeah. order. So, uh, Roger Douglas is in favour of uh, compulsory private pension schemes. And as I say, they, New Zealanders don't particularly care for the idea. Uh, and I don't particularly care for the idea either, actually. Um, partly because I don't like things that are compulsory. That's the main reason. And if, for example, suppose I were tomorrow, suppose I was diagnosed with cancer and I have three years to live. Well, it's disgraceful that the government forces me not to blow that on having fun now. I, I, I should be allowed to do that. Well, okay, I don't have cancer, but maybe I still want to blow my money on having fun. Why should the government stop me? Uh, so I, I don't like these compulsory schemes, but it's not just for my libertarian principles. Also, they don't work. Singapore has a compulsory private pension scheme and they have a very high savings rate. And most people jump to the conclusion that they have this very high savings rate because of the compulsory scheme. Not at all. Most Asian countries have very high savings rates and they always have. And the reason they have is that there's no social welfare. There's no state welfare. So you've got to save to protect yourself for a rainy day. All that happened in Singapore when they instituted this scheme is that the savings that were going into private uh, vehicles for saving were transferred to the government fund, Tamashek, that then allocates the money, the investment money, to friends of the government. It's the biggest, it's a crony capitalist vehicle. They make a lot of bad investments. And it, it's, it, it's just shifting savings. In Australia, the same thing happened. The analysis of savings rates in Australia 
before and after the instituting of um, their compulsory scheme show that it didn't change at all, just changed location. Uh, the only way you can, it, it's too easy to trick the system. Right? So I can borrow against the asset that I'm saving. If I don't want to save, I can find ways around it. The only way you can increase savings rates with a, with a policy, a direct policy, is by not, by reducing the state guarantees of, of welfare. Right? So if there were no state pension, I would save a lot more than I do today. Um, the, the, and there has been no shift. The other thing that I would like to see is a shift insofar as we're going to have transfers. Uh, it, they should be done in cash. At, the pre at present, you get free education for your kids. You get free uh, health insurance. Um, well, maybe that's not what I want, right? Maybe I'm a poor person, I want to spend my money in other ways. Maybe I've got a really healthy family and they don't need much health insurance, but they're really smart and they would do well at school and I'd like to spend more on their education. I don't get that choice if I'm poor. If I'm rich, I do, but if I'm poor, I don't. Or maybe the other way around. Maybe my kids are really dumb. There's no point sending them to school. I should get them into work immediately and we should all go on a holiday uh, to France. If it's done in cash, then I can, express, I, I can live by my standards. And there's a big, you know, there's a terrible thing to happen in Britain. You've all heard of the universal basic income, right, this idea. Well, there's a new idea in Britain, which is that it should be universal basic services or goods. So the state will actually, I'm not making this up, this is, the state will provide you with your food, your housing, f your free bus passes, free, like everything will be supplied by the state. Um, it's a terrible idea. Now, what's the other one? The other one was... Um, Agricultural subsidy. Yes, I was invited to talk on the radio about comparing the New Zealand with Brexit. The British farmers won't get, won't be part of the common agricultural policy anymore. So there's this big question: what's going to happen to them because they now live off subsidies? And I, I told the story on the radio of what happened in New Zealand, um, and, and it's generally a positive story. I, I'll give you a little bit more detail than I did. The wine industry emerging is the best part of the story in my opinion but but other things happened so the farming industry became fantastically more efficient farms got bigger um, and they started using technology and machinery in ways that made them much more efficient my cousin is a dairy farmer he's got about five five hundred um, cows and he and one other guy farm <laughs> To do the whole farm. He's got, I think, I don't know how many hectares, huge, huge farm. It's managed, just two people working on it. And it's a massive business, making huge sums of money. Uh, and, and that's, New Zealand went from having relatively inefficient farming sector to a highly efficient farming sector. And the use of land became rational because the pricing of the land became rational. And some, I think what would probably happen in Europe is you would find that things that are being grown here now that shouldn't be, would, that would stop. Um, the land would be reallocated to other uses. And, and there would probably be fewer farmers. But that's not a bad thing. Uh, farming don't have to farm. Um, and, uh, I, but I don't, I don't like to predict because you don't know. That's the whole glory of free markets. It, people will come up with ideas that you couldn't have imagined. Um, in New Zealand, if there was less farming, residential property would be cheaper. But uh, I, I think that the common agricultural policy is uh, immoral. I mean, I'll tell you why I think it's immoral. Uh, it, it, most poor countries, uh, they make, uh, they're agricultural. And the policies, Europe and the United States policies that restrict the purchase of their products and subsidize their competitors here is an attack on the poorest people in the world. And it's always, it's done by people who present themselves as caring. Uh, it's, un it's astonishing to me. And uh, you know, I, uh, these farmers you see, like the French ones on their tractors, uh, they should be ashamed of themselves. So thank you so much for your interesting and hilarious talk. I think it's a pretty good example on how things can change in quite radically and, and fast in a few years. Um, so thank you for coming. I remind you that on 
the 17th, I think, if I'm okay. Yeah, and on the 17th of May, we are going to have a dinner with Anna Jane, which is the CEO of uh, Abyss Aguirre, Aguirre Newman. And, well, she will be talking about the future of, of Barcelona as a global city. So thanks for coming and see you on the next one. Thank you.